if you would see her in a group of sisters, you wouldn't probably notice her. She was so ordinary. Quite short, they say that around five feet three. Uh, no special features. If you would see her before she entered religious life, uh, still before she received the habit that covered everything, and you would see her in the group of her friends, you would probably not notice her either because she was so ordinary. Though there is one factor that always comes to my mind when I think about her before entering the religious life, her hair. They said she had beautiful hair, like very thick, strawberry brown, blonde. So that could be a little bit outstanding factor. That could draw your attention a little. Or maybe her freckles, because not many people have freckles, don't they? But besides of that, nothing such an ordinary person who doesn't attract attention of people. But did she attract the attention of God? Did she not? In quite a spectacular way. And when you read her diary, it's really a love story. She wanted to love God more than all the other people, more than anyone ever loved him. That's quite bold. And she was bold. In that relationship with God, she was super bold, super daring, and I love it about her. So her life's goal was very clear. I want to be a great saint, and being a great saint means means loving him with my whole heart, my whole being. There's nothing that will stop me on that way of union with God. And when you have such a clear life's goal, you don't waste your energy. You focus on that life goal and you just go there. She has this beautiful sentence in her diary. She says, I have directed my flight at the very center of the sun's heat, and nothing can lower its course. I love it. Now, I have a question to you all. Who here wants to go to heaven? Please raise your hands. Who here wants to go to heaven? Again, raise your hands. Wonderful, everyone understood my Polish English? Great, beautiful, I honestly hoped everyone will raise their hands. Uh, if not, I would be quite scared what to do without, with you. But okay, you all want to go to heaven. Now the other question, which comes as a natural consequence of the first question is, who here wants to help others to get to heaven? Okay, I believe that's all. That's, again, everyone, almost. Like, others just didn't understand the question. I get, get it. Sometimes I don't understand myself either. So basically, it's twice, yes. Yes, I want to go to heaven, and yes, I want others to go to heaven, and I'm ready to help them. I want to help them. Beautiful. Brothers and sisters, expect war. Expect war. W-A-R. There will be fighting with the so-called world, which opposes the option that there even is God, that there even is heaven, and everything that reminds about him, it's going to be opposed. There will be fighting with our own nature, broken nature, which causes that we are just inclined to choose the easy ways, always the easy ways. And the path to heaven is narrow and rocky. There will be fighting with the enemy of our salvation, Satan himself, and the army of demons 
They are real. And they will do everything that's in their power to stop you. And if they won't be able to stop you, at least to delay your growth, your progress, your, your entering into union with God. Without further ado, the topic of today's talk is spiritual warfare. The battles both you and me go through on a daily basis on our way to heaven and trying to help others to get there too. And we can learn a lot from Saint Faustina. She was a true warrior, a noble knight, really amazing um, in such an ordinary person. You wouldn't expect such a spirit, but many ways, you know, the cover doesn't tell us about what's inside. First, I will share with you briefly the general information about what the church is teaching us about spiritual warfare. Then we will go into the Bible and see a little bit how was it in Jesus' life and then to Faustina. But even before that, so that listening to this talk would be very practical for you. I want you to think for a moment about the battles you go through. Daily battles with the tendencies of your fallen nature, but not in general. We know what are general tendencies of fallen nature, but what is your nature like pushing you to do, to choose daily, you don't want that, but every day you feel that push. The challenges, the temptations that happen in you. Think about the external obstacles too. Maybe, you know, in your surroundings, maybe you are the only person who actually believes in God, in your work, in your college in your family, the only person who actually strives for holiness or takes God seriously. Just think about those concrete examples in your life. Have them in front of your eyes as you will listen to the talk. And then I believe you will hear some very concrete answers and you will be equipped how to face those difficulties, those challenges, those battles in a new way, stronger. For this I pray. All Christians are engaged in warfare, whether they know it or not. St. Paul says that it is a spiritual war and in such war only spiritual weapons will work. In his letter to Ephesians, oh, by the way, he's here. <laughs> I always remind that he's here and he said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That's powerful. The weapons we fight with have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, which weapons are these? We want to know. We need to know. And that information is coming soon. So stay with us. Are you aware that every day when you say our Father, actually the two last petitions are regarding the spiritual warfare? Like every day you live with that awareness saying, our Father, there is a war going on and I need your help, God. The war is real. I need your real presence in my life and your real help. We say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Catechism of Catholic Church explains, God tempts no one. On the contrary, he wants to set us free from evil. 
we ask him not to allow us to take the way that leads to sin. So kind of to stop us when the way, when the path opens in front of us, Lord, don't let me even enter on that path. This petition also implores the spirit of discernment and strength. And the discernment we are talking about is between trials and temptations. They are trials which will come as a necessary tool for our growth. But they are also temptations which will come to lead us to sin and death. Trials and temptations, both difficult but totally not the same, with different direction. Trials to help you grow, temptations to bring you down. So we ask for the Holy Spirit to show us the difference, to give us the spirit of discernment. The battle with the temptation, that's the Catechism of Catholic Church, the battle with the temptation and the victory become possible only, only, through prayer. And at moments, preparing this talk, I needed to like really repeat the topic of the prayer, to, to, uh, the topic of the talk to myself again and again, spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare, not to actually write a talk about the power of prayer, because everything was about that. Whatever I was reading, whatever I was meditating on, it's the power of prayer. That's spiritual warfare, that's our tool. And I could end the talk here, basically, but we'll go into details. Haven't you noticed that actually uh, one of the greatest successes of the evil spirit nowadays is that he made us so occupied with so many important things that we have no time for prayer. He knows what he's doing. Because each time you start to pray, you equip yourself for battles. You, you become stronger. You enter the union with God, which is the almighty God. And he fears that. Satan fears these moments of prayer. That's why also all of those distractions, maybe one day we will have a talk about distractions in prayer. It's all his work. He doesn't want us to enter into the depths of prayer, to be recollected, to stay on prayer, to persevere even if we feel nothing. Winning these battles for the time for prayer might be the, the greatest success of your life. To pray every day and not to give the Lord and not to give for the prayer just a chunk of time and in the worst time a period in like part of the day when you're just asleep start planning the day from choosing the best time for prayer you need that i need that we all need that faustina writes in her diary everyone there are no exceptions the saints need prayer the sinners need prayer those who are converting need prayer great sinners need prayers Everyone needs to pray hard. No exceptions. In the Gospel of Matthew, now let's see how was it in Jesus' life, the spiritual warfare in Jesus' life. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, we read the famous temptation, about the famous temptation in the desert. Jesus is fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. We know that Jesus triumphs in that desert temptation, but it is important to mark that he does it as a man. He's not using his divine powers to overcome Satan and his temptations. He's just a man in that temptation. He knows that if I would use my divine powers, what examples would I give to my brothers and sisters? Because they don't have access to miracles. I will show them how to do it as a man so that they can follow literally my example. 
what we can learn from, first of all, from that story is the importance of spiritual preparation. In Jesus' case, it is through prayer and fasting. Later, during the very clash with the enemy, we see that Jesus repels the attack with the word of God. We see here how important is the knowledge of the scripture to, to read, to not even to read, because the, whole, the word of God is, is more than a word. That's a meeting, encounter with the living God. He is the word of God. Opening the pages of the Bible is encountering him again and again and allowing the, the knowledge of, of facts and feelings that he had and his reactions to go through our brain into our heart and then change, changing our decisions, our daily decisions and actions. We need that also to face the enemy of our salvation. Third lesson we get from that temptation Jesus faces is that he doesn't enter the dialogue with the tempter. He immediately rejects the temptation, immediately. He is weakened after 40 days of fasting. But I believe that even then, after those 40 days of fasting, I just can't see myself doing that. But after 40 days of fasting, he was so much stronger than I am. And I'm talking about Jesus as a man, not Jesus as God. He was so much stronger than I am. And then, even then, being so much stronger than I am, he didn't even allow himself to enter into the dialogue with the tempter because he knew that's too dangerous. Don't enter the dialogue. Reject the temptation as it comes. Turn your face against it. I will never forget an example that I saw when I was visiting a prison with a group of young people. And um, before we had the actual meeting with the prisoners that was... Um, praying together, sharing testimonies. They needed to show us around that somehow in the law, they just need to show you and kind of show off, show you how great they are, that they're actually doing many good things in that prison. So they took us for a tour at the prison. And so among others, they also allowed us to enter one of the cells. And above one of the beds, there were like four beds in that cell, there were holy images and above other bed, there were very unholy images. I felt so sorry for that man that he needs to be in one room with that man and to be tempted by, by those unholy images every day. And I loved the reaction of one of the young people who was there with us. Young man, beautiful man. Immediately as he entered, he turned his face to those holy images. He saw, okay, that's the temptation immediately. Even though the speaker, the person who was showing us around the prison, was standing just in front of those unholy images. And you would say, no, no, I should look at him because he's talking to me right now. No, no, I'm listening to him but looking here. See the temptation? Turn your face immediately. You are too weak to stand firm and not to follow. By saying you, I mean you and I and us, us, we are too weak. It's interesting that Satan lost the battle with Jesus on the desert and then he departed from him until the next time when Jesus was truly weakened. He didn't dare to attack Jesus when he was in his full strength. He just chose those moments when he was weakened. And the next time when he was truly weakened was um, the time of passion. He wouldn't tempt him the same way. During the time of passion, the evil spirit acts mainly through other people. And you remember those, for example, who are passing by the cross and they are provoking Jesus, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. Come down, make a miracle. And this time Jesus' response to temptation is different. He doesn't use the word of God anymore. He doesn't just turn away his face. He, 
he's, sim he's simply silent. He's simply silent. There's the power in his silence. Power to fight the temptation in his silence. I want to stop briefly at the agony of, in the garden because it also gives us an important lesson about spiritual warfare. You remember when Jesus went aside to pray to his father? It was a difficult prayer. He came back to his disciples and he found them asleep. He said, you could not keep watch with me for one hour. Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing. Remember, you all raised your hands. I want to go to heaven, and I want to help others to go to heaven. You have very willing spirits. All of you, all of us, me too. But so often I forget that, yeah, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember who you are. Acknowledge your weakness. It's nothing to be ashamed of. That's how we are now. Watch and pray. There are other moments in the gospel when Jesus basically shares with us the same message. In other words, stay awake, be prepared, watch and pray. It's always about the same thing. And do not be afraid. Greater is he who is in you than who is in the world. Let us now go to St. Faustina and learn a little bit about spiritual warfare from her. Jesus was very straightforward with her. He didn't sugarcoat the reality. He said to her, life on earth is battle indeed and a great battle for my kingdom. He said also, I will not delude you with prospects of peace and consolations. On the contrary, prepare for great battles. I don't know how about you, but I really prefer if someone is so straightforward than sugarcoating. Life on earth is a battle indeed, a great battle for my kingdom. And I, this, this word stopped me, my kingdom. What does he really mean saying my kingdom, great battle for my kingdom? And a few passages later, he says, my kingdom on earth is my life in the human soul. On another day, he asked St. Faustina, fight for my kingdom in human souls. We are reminded here very clearly, it is a spiritual war that we are in. And the souls of other people are at, at stake, not only our soul, but the, the souls of all of us. When you read the diary, sometimes people are confused because when Faustina... In Faustina's language, the way she writes about reality, she uses the words souls instead of people. In our times, describing events, we would basically say other people. I prayed for those people, I met those people. When she says, I prayed for those souls, and I met those souls, in a sense. And there was a time when I was like, this is so strange, and that might actually be discouraging for people to read the diary because they won't get it. Now, I think it's perfect because she emphasizes what's immortal, and she emphasizes it is a spiritual battle that we are in, a spiritual war. Flesh may die and will die but the soul will stay forever. It's immortal. We are immortal. And the battle, the fight is for immortality, is for eternity. It's super serious, brothers and sisters. It's super serious. And we should be now, I don't know what to say, trembling, maybe yes, maybe even crying, yes. It's super serious. 
and matches up to us. Jesus said to Faustina, I expect from you many souls. She was, I don't want to say scared, but yeah, somehow with this, he expects from me many souls. How many he expects from you? Jesus, uh, almighty God, asked Saint Faustina, help me to save souls. That's a mystery, he's almighty. He asks her, this feeble woman, help me. And I hope each and every one of you here will hear that call resounding in your heart, help me to save souls. Jesus is telling to your heart, my daughter, help me to save souls. My son, help me to save souls. There's one situation, one story in the diary of St. Faustina, which is very fitting at that point. I want to share with you, uh, it happened at midnight on August 9th, 1934. Sister Faustina was returning to her room after one hour of adoration, which she offered for the conversion of hardened sinners. And Jesus made known to her how very pleasing to him was her prayer. And let me quote the rest of the story to you directly from her diary because the way she puts it is simply the best. After the adoration, halfway to my cell, I was surrounded by a pack of huge black dogs who were jumping and howling and trying to tear me to pieces. I realized that they were not dogs, but demons. One of them spoke up in a rage. Because you have snatched so many souls away from us this night, we will tear you to pieces. Try to stay calm in such situation. But she did. She continues, I answered, if that is the will of the most merciful God, tear me to pieces, for I have justly deserved it because I am the most miserable of all sinners. And God is ever holy, just, and infinitely merciful. To these words, all the demons answered as one, let us flee, for she is not alone. The Almighty is with her. And they vanished like dust, like the noise of the road, while I continued on my way to my room, undisturbed, finishing my hymns of praise to God and pondering his infinite and unfathomable mercy. And we could say, and I went to bed. Good night. She literally disarms me. This is unbelievable how she reacts to seeing a huge pack of black dogs who are holding and threatening her and she knows these are demons. And she's like, yeah, whatever God wants. There's always this deep wisdom behind it, like nothing ha happens without his permission. There are things which are not his will, but nothing happens without his permission, which could, should keep us in deep peace, basically, whatever happens. What we should, um, the, the conclusion we should have from that situation is, look, the demon spoke in a rage, you have snatched so many souls away from us this night. How did she do it? They were working hard for days and months and years maybe to really like, how to say, possess those people, 
like entrap them, pull them into darkness. And then she was simple religious sister. She just went on adoration and she prayed for them and done. Of course, there is a lot behind this, but there's her whole life in that prayer. It's not just this one hour, but yes, definitely, their story shows us the power of prayer. And I want you to remember that. Each time you go on prayer, it's even if you don't feel anything, and Jesus doesn't give you any consolations or doesn't speak to your heart how pleasing your prayer was to him and how many souls you snatched away from the hands of the demons this night. Doesn't matter, because you know good things happened. He used that prayer, that honest, humble prayer of yours, even if full of distractions, he used that. If you had that pure intention, saving souls, Lord, you can save them. Lord, you can save them. Lord, you can save them. Save them, save them. The another important conclusion for us from that story is, look, when they said, when they were scared, when was the moment when they actually decided to run away? They said, after her confession and kind of like agreement, okay, you can just do with me whatever you want, and she just started telling them about how wonderful God is, and then they said, let us run away. She is not alone. They noticed, they realized she lives in the presence of God. Her power was not in herself. Her power was in the Almighty who was with her. Some, I guess the last few years, when each time I say the creed, I really emphasize, if not with, with words, I emphasize it in my heart when I say I believe in God, the Father Almighty. The Father Almighty. He is the Father and He is Almighty. I need to be reminded that my Father is Almighty and there is my strength. So, Jesus asked Faustina to help him to, re to save souls. And there's this very powerful quotation in the diary when he says to her, my daughter, I want to instruct you on how you are to rescue souls. You will save more souls through prayer and suffering than will a missionary through his teachings and sermons alone. What am I even doing here? I am kind of like missionary, yeah. I'm kind of doing some teachings. Before I came to you, uh, I really, really prayed and offered, and my sisters did. So I believe that God will use that teaching for salvation of souls. But only because it's supported, it's based on the foundation of prayer and suffering. Teaching alone cannot do much, but based on foundation of prayer and suffering, yeah. Jesus says so, I believe it. So you had the example of how it works um, after one hour of adoration that St. Faustina had. And believe me, that woman suffers a lot for other souls. Throughout her diary, you see how much she suffers and everything offers for others. What she keeps on repeating, as it's like a rhythm, like a beating of her heart, it's God and souls, God and souls, God and souls. I do it for God and souls.
some people, when they start reading the diary from the first notebook, so basically starting from page one, they can't pass through it. They say it's too difficult. There's too much suffering there, and that's just the beginning of her religious life. So without entering into details of how she suffered, believe me, she suffered a lot, but she embraces it. She knows it's for a reason. She's a, like a real knight. If you are a fighter, a soldier, you know you are Jesus' army. You know how he was fighting for the souls. You know how much it cost him, and you know you belong to his army. Y you won't be surprised that it costs you as well. Won't you? At least through this talk, I also want to remind us about it. When Faustina makes an act on, of offering herself for the salvation of souls, she knows that as a consequence of that, difficulties will come, sufferings will come, challenges will come. And that's why she repeats her, repeats her act of offering herself for others again and again not to be surprised when things get difficult. I know why, and I know for what reason, and I'm willing to take the blow again and again. I will become like a shield protecting others. This is how Our Lady is, how Blessed Mother is. In so many revelations, she is shown as this kind of a shield protecting us. But the blows stop on her. Remember, even in the moment of presentation of Jesus in the temple, when she's just a young mother then, it's being prophesied that the sword will pierce her heart. And it's more than one sword. Brothers and sisters, there's still so much to say. I knew it. I just knew I won't make it in half an hour. And it happened. I'm a prophet. <laughs> so let us stop where we are right here and right now. Let us allow this, what we just heard, to s soak it in. Like just, just give yourself time. Maybe a month only. Maybe it will be the next month that there will be the second part of this talk. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Allow this to work in you. Try to see the workings of the evil spirit, of the temptations of your fallen nature, the influences of the world. Try to see how it actually has an impact on your daily life. And start from choosing the best time for prayer. Not just chunks of your time, but the best time for prayer and, and becoming a, a prayerful fighter, fight with your prayers. Not only for yourself, for your own sanctification, but fight for others. Asking God to increase your faith in the power of your prayer. You are really important in the history of salvation. It's not just Saint Faustina or other saints, John Paul II, great saints. Who am I? You are important. There's a great mission to be done. There, God entrusts you some souls, particular souls, one day you will know who was that. Fight for them. Amen.